All right. Okay, amen. So, so as we've been reviewing uh, this uh, particular, we've been working our way through this epistle that Paul gives, this epistle of reproof to this church, uh, it, you, know, you see the failures of a carnal church. And a carnal church is made up of carnal Christians that don't want to grow up. And, and Paul spends the first four chapters showing their failure in terms of the upward look as it relates to God. Uh, he was showing the, the divisions, the contentions, the factions, the denominations is all due to the fact that you've gotten your eyes off of God. So Paul spends about four chapters just trying to reset the upward look. Now we're going to come to chapters 5 and 6, and Paul's going to begin shifting to the inward look and then the outward look. The inward look is to self, and then the outward look is to how it affects others. And Paul's going to move down, but the first four chapters, the upward look. The most important thing, folks, is the upward look. Are you looking to God? Are you you're trusting God? Are you counting on God to do the work that's necessary for salvation, both providing salvation and then working salvation through you? You want to keep that upward look. He spends the first four chapters reminding them of the upward look. Now, today we come to the fifth chapter. He's going to begin the inward look. And uh, if you were to title this chapter, the chapter would be entitled, I guess, Church Discipline. And you're going to see Paul's going to open up the topic of discipline within the church. Now, uh, it'll break down into a few portions, this chapter. It'll break down into three. First, he'll discuss the, uh, the problem. He'll address the problem. And then he'll advance a principle that should be applied. And then he'll apply a practice that should be practiced in the church. But first he'll start with the problem. We'll be looking at church discipline. So let's look at the problem first in verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so Paul opens up this teaching, getting right to this problem. And he's going to talk about church discipline in this passage. Now, church discipline is not a subject that is talked about in many churches. Uh, in the modern American Laodicean 21st century church, uh, just uh, the discussion of this will, uh, it causes fear in most saints. I mean, in what I call sorry saints. They, I'm, I feel sorry for them. They don't know which Bible is God's. They're just goofy. I was one of them. I mean, I got saved in a sorry saint church with an NIV. I was goofy. I had no doctrine. And if you were to mention church discipline in an assembly with sorry saints, if you were to mention it, teach on it, or even apply it once, I would bet you would lose a large portion of that congregation. The exercise of church discipline is so likely to scare a sorry saint that he'll run away. That it's not to be that way, and Paul's going to address this. Paul's going to try and give his balance. Now, on the other hand, there are these super saints, and, uh, and I love them too, and they're the best of the best of the best. And, and I, I, I really do think highly of them. The problem with them is then they start looking beyond themselves and everyone else. And to a super saint, he'd love to apply church discipline on a weekly basis to just about everyone that comes through the door. He'd like to have a tribunal, a pastor would like to see you, a pastor would like to talk to you, and, and straighten things out. Now that's another balance. It excites these people, and, and that's, that's out of balance too. Paul wants, we want to take a look at this in the way Paul would like to look at. This is serious stuff. 
And it's not stuff that needs to be applied too often. And he'll show you in this passage right here. Let's take a look at this problem. It is reported. Here's the next word, the problematic word. Commonly. This is a common report. This is, everyone on the street knows about this. Not just the saints, but the neighbors know about what's going on at your particular church. Your church has fornication. Your church is, is behaving in a manner that's contrary to God's law. All right. Now, fornication is something that is forbidden in the scriptures. So you go all the way back uh, to Leviticus 18, and God writes an entire chapter about fornication. Fornication is having sexual relations with someone to whom you're not married. And the Bible is expressly forbids this. And uh, after the doings of the land of Egypt, ye shall not do. After the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, ye shall not do. Ye shall do my judgments. Ye shall keep mine ordinances. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. And he's going to walk through every possible permutation of sex outside the marriage bed that God condemns. Fornication is condemned. Plain and simple. Why is that? Well, God loves purity. God loves the family. And the family is the center of what God birthed in the garden. A husband, a wife, children, purity. It's the building block from which God brings forth new life through procreation. It's the building block from which God would like to bring forth eternal life in that the father and the mother raise the children in a pure manner and guide them to Jesus Christ. It's the building block in which God wants to build a nation such as the nation of Israel, and from Judah, from this family, comes this tribe, and from Benjamin comes this tribe, and all this are birthed by families. It's the building block from which God would like to build a church nowadays, in strong families together. Husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Fathers not provoking their children to wrath. All these types of things that God would like to do to build a church that would be a testimony to the, the purity and the holiness and the goodness of God. And so he, he speaks about this. Now, now the problem, maybe the Corinthian church misunderstood some of the teachings of the New Testament and thought, well, we're under grace. So uh, since grace seems to cover sin, we'll let sin abound, that grace may more abound. And that may have been the thought they had. But the misunderstanding is if you, you work your way through the New Testament, go to Acts 15. And Acts 15 is uh, uh, an ordinance given in the New Testament. Acts chapter 15, there had been some men who had been teaching doctrine that it's not enough to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. You also need the salvation of Jesus Christ plus the keeping of the law of the Jews. And of course, they came together and they had a conference, a, a solemn conference, of an assembly of uh, apostles figuring these things out and working it out. And they came to the conclusion that, um, verse 11... But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. And they came to the conclusion that salvation is by grace and not by even the works of Leviticus. It's, it's by the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, then, then the question is, well, then what do we do if we're New Testament saints? And he says, here's what we're going to do. Verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is, and this is the Apostle James, this is the Lord Jesus' uh, half-brother, and he's, he's presiding over this conference here. He, Peter's there, Paul is there, all the other apostles are there, and this is the word that he's given from God. My sentence is that we trouble not them which from the Gentiles are turned to God. You've turned to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, 
keep away from idolatry, and from fornication. So, so if you are a Gentile, what are what one of the things you have to do in addition to Jesus Christ? Well, I mean, you get saved, obviously, but then what does Jesus want to do? Turn from idolatry. Stay from all forms of idolatry. Okay. Idol well, well, there's no idolatry. There's no statues here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. There's idolatry in religious writings. Turn from all religious writings and turn to the Word of God. Any other religious writings can be idolatry. Be very careful about religious writings, even by Bible believers. Okay? If they're guiding you into the Scriptures, then thank the Lord that they're guiding you into the Scriptures, but don't allow them to stand on their own. Okay? Turn from any form of idolatry, whether it be the, the statue form or the written form. And from fornication. Turn from fornication. And Paul will continue this in every one of his epistles. Go to the next epistle, Romans chapter 1. And we won't read them all, but we'll just take a look. Romans chapter 1. What kind of people do this, commit this type of act? Verse 28, talking about even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. People who want nothing to do with God. Well, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Fornication is not right. It's just not right. And so Paul will mention it in Romans. He'll mention it in Galatians. It's a work of the flesh. He'll mention it in Ephesians. He'll mention it in Colossians. He'll mention it in 1 Thessalonians. The, the reference in 1 Thessalonians is interesting. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's working it through his church epistles. It's sad because we grow, we grew up in a nation. If you were to read through Leviticus 18, he kind of follows, chronicles the sins, and, and probably the greatest sin that God dealt with from a physical standpoint in his people was adultery and fornication, because it tore the family apart. It fractures the family. It breaks up the very unit that God is trying to work in. It, it, it eventually destroyed the nation of Israel. There was a a time when the people followed the teaching of the Midianites through the preaching of Balaam and Balak, and they ended up committing fornication. And God was so angered that God killed 23,000 of them in a plague. I mean, it, it just, it, it angers God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God. Everybody says, I want to know what the will of God is. Well, here it is. Here's it real simple. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. Sanctus, to be holy. Focaccio, to make holy. That you would be made holy. God's desire is that you would be made holy. That you would no longer be carnal. That you'd no longer be worldly. That you'd no longer be after your own lust. But you would be moved to the next level of holiness. And notice how he starts you. That you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence. It's a big word that means a desire to look at members of the opposite sex and handle the opposite sex and do things with them. That's the lust of the concupiscence. Who does that? Even as the Gentiles, which know not God. I mean, if, if you just reduce it down to simplicity and you watch, I was trying to tell a teenager the other day, son, it comes down to two choices. The choices in your life are either going to be virtue or vice. The vice squad. I mean, that's it. It's, it's God and virtue, or it's turning from God and turning to vice and, and the lust of the world. And when, and when you come right down to it and you watch just about any movie, it all centers around, uh, eventually there's alcohol, there might be some tobacco, I don't know. But there's alcohol and then there's adultery. And the television shows are ripe with it. And 
such is the culture of the Gentiles which know not God. And so Paul will mention it, you know, in every one of his epistles, at least one time. But in the book of Corinthians, he's got to mention it eight times. Eight times in the book of Corinthians. Because they had just gotten to the point where they had become worldly. They had turned away. They, they lost the upward look. And when you lose the upward look, you start to lose the inward look too. You no longer see yourself properly. You only see yourself properly in God's light next to Jesus Christ. And now they've lost the inward look. And he says it's commonly reported. Everybody knows you're doing this. I mean, I'm hearing this from everywhere. Everybody knows, oh yeah, that's the church where, you know, <laughs> you can do the same at that church that you can do in the brothel down the street. It's commonly reported. And, and not only this, not only regular fornication, you have such fornication, and this is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Well, they have a name for it today. It's called incest. And I was listening to some guy going through a number of statistics about incest and uh, the, the, the concept that within families, sex occurs between members of the families. Between the... the it just doesn't make sense to me. This, my mind doesn't compute this kind of stuff, but, but he was reading the numbers. And, and in interviews with girls that uh, are prostitutes, harlots, and with guys that are in prison, I mean, the numbers were like 70 to 80% of them had been involved in incest at some point in their life. I mean, and Paul's saying, and this is going on in your church. And the, the sad thing is, verse 2, and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. Now, how could you be puffed up about this? I heard a report just recently, if you're good at uh, computers, I, I'm not real good at them, I wish, and I wish I had a printer sometimes, but, but there's this uh, guy in New England, his name is Eugene Robinson, and this guy, Eugene Robinson, uh, at the age of 25, he got married and then had a couple kids. And he had determined early on in his life, he wanted to be a doctor, but then he, then he determined, you know, I think I'll go into ministry. He just had a feeling ministry would be good. And he went on to study in the Episcopal Church of the USA to become a priest. And then about 10 or so years into his life, he left his wife for another man and came out openly. And the Episcopal Church of the USA, instead of condemning it, embraced it and made him a bishop and gave him his own diocese. And then they had, he had, of course, the first was a private ceremony with this man, a civil ceremony done somewhere. But then the church decided to confirm it and have a big church wedding for him and this guy. And they came down the aisle with their earrings and they kissed on the mouth in front of everybody and people stood up and applauded and they were puffed up about that. Why? Because they're inclusive, you see because they're tolerant, because they want to be a place that embraces sinners in their sin. And they're mistakenly thinking. What they ought to be is mourning about this. What they ought to be doing is purging this. The house of God is the pillar and ground of truth, and it's the place of purity. If, if the world is like the, the troubled sea that's cast up the mire and is shaken about with all the dirt inside of us and we are like the ark of Noah floating upon that sea. It's all right for us to be in the world as a witness to the world, but it's not all right for the world to be in us. We don't want the water in the boat. And they're bringing the muck and the mire in and saying, isn't this wonderful? Look what we're doing. And they were puffed up about it rather than mourning about it, that this man that had done this deed should be taken away from you. There needs to be church discipline. The, the motto, and this is a Bible, Psalm 97, verse 10. That, that seems judgmental. 
What, what are you saying? You, you hate that kind of thing? Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. I mean, this is something that the book of Amos tells us this, and Amos 5.15, the book of Romans tells us this, and Romans 12.9, the book of Hebrews tells us this, that Jesus hated evil. That's one of the reasons God loved Jesus, was because he hated evil. I thought God is love. Yes, God is perfectly balanced. He has love. He loves purity. He loves holiness. He loves that which is good. He hates sin. He hates wickedness. He hates abomination. He hates evil. It's destructive. It brings ruin. It brings death. It brings eternal separation. God doesn't want that. God's not willing that any should perish. So go back to where we are in 1 Corinthians 5. I mean, you're puffed up rather than mourning about it. You're embracing it rather than purging it. So, so Paul says, verse 3, I'll tell you what I... Now, Paul wasn't even in the city at the time. He's only hearing about it. I, verily, truly, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, I've judged already. Well, I thought you're not supposed to judge. Well, Paul just told you a couple chapters back, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. See, someone who's worldly has difficult judging. Someone who's carnal doesn't understand judgment. But, 1 Corinthians 2, 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. I can understand an action that I have seen, Paul says. Now look, I can't judge the motive in someone's heart, but I really don't care about the motive of his heart. There's times when Paul says, I don't care why he did it, it's just that he did it. And it's wrong. Well, well it's because he, I don't care how he was raised. It's because he was out on a tear all night drinking. I don't care that he was out on a tear drinking. What he did was wrong. And I can judge the wrongness of the action. And Paul says, I'm a spiritual man, and even though I'm not there, if I hear about something like this, in my spirit, I've judged already, as though I were present, concerning the one that had done this. Verse 4, now here's what I say. Are you saying this, Paul, on your own? No, I'm saying in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to do. When you're gathered together, and my spirit will be gathered with you, I want you to do this with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who will put down all sin and rebellion one day. With the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What does that mean? It means you take him and you remove him from the church. You tell him you're not welcome in this assembly anymore. You're living in open sin that everybody knows about. It's commonly reported. It's besmirching the church of Jesus Christ. It's taking the church of Jesus Christ down to such a level. I mean, look, there are country clubs that have higher standards than this. There are country clubs that won't allow you in unless you have the recommendation of two members. And you dress a certain way and behave a certain way. Or they'll remove you from the country club. And this is the church of Jesus Christ. The pinnacle, the gemstone that God's put on planet earth. And you're permitting this here? You turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You put him out of the church. You put him back into the world where the prince of this world, the God of this world, is ruling. And if he wants to sow to the flesh, then of the flesh he'll reap corruption and let that happen to it out, uh, let that happen out there. But not in this assembly anymore. It's like, uh, again, when the ship takes on water, you bail. You, you get the stuff out. That dirty water, you get it out of there. And you clean it up. And this is what he's saying you're supposed to do. This is the way it is to be done. Why? End of verse 5. That the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Two references. First off, that the spirit of the church, that you'll continue to have a good spirit in the church. You know what this will do? If someone is living in open sin in the church and it's not addressed, and factions and divisions permit this. 
Because then what will happen is there'll be one little clique or one little faction that will surround that person and be their defender. And there'll be another faction over here that's upset. That you've lost unity in the church. The spirit of unity in the bond of peace has been lost in the church. So the spirit of the church needs to be maintained. We're unified for one purpose and one purpose only, to worship God in spirit and truth, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt the Savior, to edify and cleanse one another and encourage and exhort one another onto good works. That's what we're here for. We'll have lost the spirit in the church if we don't get this guy out. And a lot of churches have lost their spirit. The second thing, to save the spirit in the day of the Lord Jesus, it's also, discipline is not just done for the purity of the church. It's done to restore the sinner. In other words, and by the way, this will only work. Let me tell you something. This will only work if you have a church that has a unity in the spirit and has love. If you have one of those kind of churches that's real judgmental and in your face all the time, it's a blessing to get put out of it. Who wants to be there? <laughs> be my guest and put me out. But if you have a church body where the brothers and the sisters love each other and minister one to another, and you're removed from it and you're put back out in the world where all there is is that phony Hollywood superficial kissy kind of love, but nobody cares for you, and you've been put out there. Now, your soul's already saved. This man's soul is saved. But his own spirit will start to wither away. And then what will happen is, as his spirit withers, and then God ministers to him, and it comes broken, and then he, he repents, and then he's restored, then his spirit is set back up again, and in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of being found in the world, he's found back in the church again, and his spirit is saved too. His, not his soul, his spirit. He'll have a good spirit again. He won't be ashamed. So it's to restore the sinner too. You see, the, the discipline in a church... Is not like a law enforcement officer going after a crook or a criminal. The discipline in the church is like a father taking care of a child and wanting to see the child come to his senses and come back to the place where blessing is, Amen. not the place of cursing in the world. That's why the discipline is exercised. And that's why he wants this done, for the, for the saving of the spirit of the church and the saving of the spirit of the sinner. proper balance. The problem, we need to address the problem for the good of, here you will, the good of the sinner. We're doing it for the good of the sinner, actually. This is, this is like a, if a member of your family got sick with an infection, and it's one thing when you get like a regular virus and it goes away in three or four days, but if a sickness lingers and worsens and weakens many of the organs of the body, you don't want that person to die. You know what you want them to recover. And you'll do whatever it takes to get them to recover. And if it requires being quarantined and being put on IV antibiotics and whatever's necessary, you want them recovered and restored. That's your desire. And so the problem needs to be addressed for the good of this particular sinner. I want to see him restored. Now the principle is, I want to advance a principle in verses 6, 7, and 8, and this is for the good of the church. Now, for the church, I want to explain to you, your glorying, oh, we're so tolerant, is not good. Why? Well, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. He's saying this, you, you know, he's saying, well, there's not a lot going on in our church. It, it's just this one guy. The rest of us are living okay. This is one guy is the problem. And he says, well, here's the problem with this. When you take bread, dough, and you start to make or bake this dough, if you put just a little bit of leaven, leaven is yeast. I think it's saccharomyces is the name of it. And here's what it does. It, as the baking occurs, it begins to foam and it puffs up that bread. And not just in one area, it works its way through and it spreads and it foams and puffs and puts bubbles all through the bread. In other words, if you allow this here, the principle is this thing is gonna spread. 
there, there's something about, uh, go to the book of Haggai. Small book toward the back of the Old Testament. It's the third last book in the Old Testament. So go to Matthew and back up a few books. It's a principle that works in medicine, and it's a principle that works spiritually. And look at Haggai chapter 2. This concept of contamination and spreading. Haggai chapter 2, verse 11. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, and here's the question you ask the priest, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered, No. No, I can't. If I have a holy... Uh, unleavened bread here that I'm carrying on my way to put it on the table of showbread and I bump up against another piece of bread, it doesn't confer holiness to it. No, that, that's not the way it works. Okay. Ask him another question. Verse 13. Then said Haggai, ask him another one. If one that's unclean by a dead body touch any one of these, shall it be unclean? The priest answered, of course. Yeah, sure, it'll be unclean. And so he says, now what about this? So let's say there's a guy, he's out there, he's touched a, an unclean dead body and he's got some bacteria on him. And now he comes by and touches someone else. Can he confer uncleanness? The answer is yes. I mean, if, if I have a guy that has leprosy and, and it's a weeping leprosy, a contaminating type of a leprosy, I want him to get better. And then I have a top flight Olympic athlete in perfect health. I got an idea. I'll put the athlete in the same room with the leper and, and he'll confer the health to the leper. Does it work that way? It doesn't work that way. What's likely to happen is the guy with the leprosy is going to confect the, the Olympiad, infect him. And so, so Paul's trying to say, look, at this is the principle of leavening. You get a little bit in there. You get one leper and you put him in a, in a child uh, daycare center where all the kids are healthy. And just let him run around for a few days and see what will happen. He'll leaven the whole place. They'll all be sick in a month. You've got to purge this out. The principle is you've got to put the evil away. Now, this is hard for our minds to accept because nobody does it. I mean, welcome to the world. Welcome to planet Earth. But I can assure you, nothing that defileth will enter into God's presence. And he will purge the evil. So just... So, so purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, verse 7. Even as ye are unleavened, you've been saved. Now watch this verse. For, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I'm going to explain that, but that, that famous verse, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. It's a wonderful phrase. We use it all the time in a doctrinal sense to explain that Christ is the Passover lamb. He was the ultimate Passover sacrifice for us. But look at the context of how he's writing it. What he's saying is, you've got to put this sinner away in the same way that God put Jesus Christ away when he became sin for us. I mean, if Christ could be smitten of God for bearing sin. Christ could be smitten of God. This guy's above Jesus Christ? That he can't be smitten for his sin? Oh, that deacon over there is too good? That pastor over there is too good? Now that he's fallen into gross sin that everyone knows about? I mean, if Christ got sacrificed, you sacrifice him too. You sacrifice the sinner and purge him. Because God was willing to sacrifice Christ and that guy's no better than God's son. That's the context that he wrote it in. It's an amazing verse. I know this, would, this won't fly in modern Christianity, but, but here it is, properly taken in its context. So let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now look at he uses this term about leaven. And he's talking about the leaven of sin. In, in the principle that he's going to show us is that 
for the good of the search, the good of the church, for the good of the church, there are reasons to put people out. And the reasons are flagrant sin. Sin that's so flagrant that everybody knows about it. And he mentions it in the first verse. He'll mention more of them in verse 11. Uh, whether it be fornication, covetousness, idolaters, railer, someone that fights all the time, a drunkard, an extortioner. Any one of these flagrant sins is worthy of saying to someone, look, you're not welcome at the assembly anymore. You've got to go. Since you enjoy that so much, go back in the world. Don't come back here anymore. Number one is flagrant sins. Another reason he'll give you, uh, go back to Romans 16. He'll use the same thing about leaven. The leaven of flagrant sin. Romans chapter 16, and we'll look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. And he'll continue the thought in the companion book to Romans, which is Galatians chapter 5. So Romans 16, verse 17, goes with Galatians 5. He'll use the same phrase here in verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, in Corinthians, he was talking about the leaven of flagrant sin. In Galatians, he's talking about the leaven of false doctrine or heresy. How do I know? Uh, go back uh, verse uh, 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, for you're fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. What avails you something? Faith, which worketh by love. I mean, you did run well. You used to know this. Who did hinder you that you should not obey this truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Someone's taught you false doctrine. And the false doctrine was that Christ is only good for your, origi or for your original sin but you're good for the rest. Or Christ only do part of your salvation work. You need to keep some of the works of Moses like circumcision or maybe baptism to do the rest. He said, that's leaven. You've got to put that out. And if someone's causing this offense contrary to the doctrine, causing a division, you put him out. Okay? So whether it be flagrant sin or false doctrine or it'll be spoken of as heresy in Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Flagrant sin or false doctrine is a reason for putting someone out of the assembly. Now listen to me, here's why. You say sin is worse than false doctrine. Sin does affect our inward look because we're not seeing ourselves properly anymore, and we're using our vessel not to sanctification, but to unrighteousness. But doctrine affects the upward look. It gives us the wrong view of God. And it all begins with God. So Paul, you know, Corinthians is the second mention. Romans was really the first. Whether it be false doctrine or flagrant sin, these are reasons to break fellowship. I mean, if it goes on around here, you know, because God ordained me to do this, I'm going to see to it the person's going to be put out. If there's a flagrant, repetitive sin that is breaking the unity of the church, or there's false doctrine that's going to break the unity of this church, then my job is, you know, Paul would say, I've judged in spirit as though I'm already there. By the power of Jesus Christ, put them out. Now, I'm not putting them out because I just, I, I'm putting them out because I'm actually praying for them. I want them to repent and be restored. That's always my desire, but it needs to be done. Another reason you put someone or break fellowship, the third reason, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Whether it's false doctrine or flagrant sin, or here's another one that might be tough nowadays, but let's see what the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Picking it up at verse 10. For even when we were um, with you, even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all. God's due order is that a man is meant to work. And if a man is not willing to work, that's a disorderly man. And the problem with being disorderly and having too much time on your hands is you become a busybody. And you get involved in other people's lives. And what happens? You drag them down too. Verse 12. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. I mean, the first thing I want to do is just tell them, brother, get a job. Go, go to work. If God gave you a body and you're able to stand on your own two feet and you're able to use your arms and you can still speak and you get a job, go to work. That's God's order. Why? Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 17, My Father worketh hitherto. What are you, above God? This concept that you can live your life without working is a crazy concept started in the Middle Ages by a guy that wrote a book called Utopia, a place where people didn't work. Utopia is a Greek word. You know what that word means? Transliterate it. Translate it means no place. Utopia means no place. There is no place like that. And the concept of setting up a society with a welfare mentality of able-bodied men not working, he says, that's, that's wrong. And let me tell you something. Continue in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 13 and 14. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Watch this, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Break fellowship with him. Break fellowship with the guy. I mean, he's being directly disobedient to a command of God. You're supposed to work. Well, you know, I mean, the lawyer told me, I don't care what the lawyer told you. You're going to be a lawyer? Obey God. And nowadays we got these rotten lawyers and no wonder Jesus said, woe to you lawyers. And Jesus said that. I see them able-bodied kids sitting around waiting for some kind of case because some lawyers lied to him. Hey, now look, if you're in a wheelchair and you can't move your legs and your arms, I understand. But I've seen what they've done and it's pitiful what lawyers do to American males nowadays. And and Bible says, you know, you try and exhort this one to work and to go on, but if he doesn't, you got to break fellowship. There are reasons to do it. Why? I'm advancing the principle for the good of the church. The church is the representative of Jesus Christ on planet Earth. And Jesus Christ was not a bum. And he's not raising a bunch of bums. And when I hear these pastors, these inner city pastors, pressing for all kinds of government programs for their people so their people don't have to work, that's not Bible. Go back to where we were in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. So I got a problem. I need to address the problem. I address the problem for the good of the sinner. I have a particular principle, Paul says, and I want to advance this principle for the good of the church. The good of the church is that, end of verse 8, that when you meet together, you're meeting with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's a phrase found also in the book of Joshua phrase found two times in your Bible. It's associated with serving God properly. Sincerity and truth. The word sincere is found two times in the Bible. It's a combination word, sin and seer. Seer is the word sera. It's where you get the word wax from, and sin is without, without wax. And it was applied originally to honey, a purified honey that had no wax in it. Pure honey, the land of milk and honey. This is the church, is the land of milk and honey. It should be sincere, pure, unmixed, being in reality what it appears to be. Heaven forbid that we appear to be a place where sin is commonly reported. Unfeigned, not hypocritical, sincere and without offense, desiring the sincere milk of the word. That's the principle I want. So now the practice. How do I practice? Let's take a look at it, verse 9. Through 13, we close it. 
Eh, so I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators. Now I got to go further, verse 10. Yeah, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, I, I told you, choose your friends carefully. Okay, well, I had all these friends before I got saved. Right, but now you're saved. Now who are your brothers and your sisters and your mothers? Those that do the will of God. Okay, so you, you leave the old behind and you come unto the new. And God will give you new friends that are better than your old friends. New friends that will exhort you to holiness and righteousness and a new way that God's trying to build inside of you. Okay, so, so but now I understand there are fornicators in the world. There are covetous, there are extortioners, there's idolaters in the world. Now you can't have no association with them because you're going to meet them when you go to work. You're going to meet them when you walk to the bus and get on the bus. You're going to, I mean, that's just the world. I mean, the only way you could not associate with them is to be raptured out of here. Paul says, I'm a realist. I understand you're going to associate with these people, but you don't company with them. You don't fellowship with them. When you got a Friday night free or a Saturday night free, you're not looking to be with them. You're looking to be with a brother or sister in the Lord. That's who you're looking to be with. Verse 11. But now I got to go a little further. Now I've written unto you not to keep company with any man that's called a brother. If that man be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner, with such a one, know not to eat. Now he's saying, okay, you got the first lesson. I'm no longer looking to hang out with my worldly friends. I'm looking to hang out with someone that calls himself a Christian. He's saying, now I want you to make discernment amongst who you company with who's called a Christian. There are carnal Christians that still live like the world, and you don't want to be with them. And there are spiritual Christians that are trying to live for the Lord. You'll know the difference. You go into the house of a carnal Christian, and it'll be no different than the house of a lost person. There'll be the same type of catalogs with the, and the same type of magazines, and the same type of TV programs, and the same type of, I mean, you, you, you walk, and you go into a spiritual Christian's house, and you'll see different reading material, you'll hear different things playing, you'll see Bibles open, you'll see, you'll, you'll see a difference. He says, now look, if you're going to choose which Christian friends to have, you choose the ones that are spiritual, not the ones that continue to be covetous. A Christian that still talks about, well, you know, my, I, I'm looking for that new car there. Which, brother, you just bought a car two years ago. You got a 2007. Yeah, but that, that new 2010, you know, why, what, what's this all about? That's covetous. Mm -hmm. you can, you, the, the best car to have from a financial standpoint is the one you own. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the cheapest. <laughs> Anything else is going to cost you more money. And that additional money could be put toward getting the gospel out. So you drive your car, you drive it in the ground, and then you get another one. But they're still covetous, whether he continues to be an idolater. He's got a couple statues around the house and a couple other religious writings around the house that he shouldn't have. He continues to be a drunkard. He continues to dr drink. You think Jesus Christ got drunk with the boys? Think he had a couple of beers on a weekend? So Paul says, I want to take you beyond just saying no to the world. You've got to say no to certain Christians out there. Well, nowadays, it's a lot of Christians. And this is how I want you to apply this practice. And I want you to apply this practice for the good of both the church and the other Christians. You want to help other Christians. This is what you want to do. Verse 12. For what, I, what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? Them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Here's the point. God wants to teach us judgment, spiritual judgment. And when it comes to the people that are without Christ, that are in the world, don't bother to judge them at all. Why? They're lost. When you make that determination, he's a lost person. Well, you know, you know the way he's living. Who cares how he's living? He's lost. Who cares how he's living? He's lost. Whether, whether he's in an incestuous relationship and he's a railer and a drunkard, or whether he's an upright, 
citizen that's now attained the office of senator, and he's a teetotaler, a Mormon senator, and he doesn't drink at all, what difference does it make? When both of them die, guess where they're going? They're going to be separated from God. They're lost. I don't, I don't waste my time judging the lost. Here's the judgment at the house of God. My eyes are toward God and his people. And in God's people, I got to take a look. And if I have a Christian that's, in, that's unrepentant about his sin or her sin, and it's commonly reported, then you have to go through the church discipline that's established in Matthew chapter 18. You know, I mean, you have a witness, you get two witnesses, you go together to that person, your desire is always to get repentance and restoration. That's always your desire. But you're going to find some people that are unrepentant. And when they're unrepentant, then it's time you go to the pastor, you go to the church, you bring it before the church in church discipline, and you put them out of the church that the spirit of the church and that the spirit of that one whom you're praying for will be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's proper church discipline. The problem needs to be addressed for the good of the sinner. The principle needs to be advanced for the good of the church. And the practice needs to be applied for the good of both. And also that the world can see there is a place that's real and different. And if you have love, they will know you're my disciples. And that's real love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us in working through what for, by our nature, is a difficult uh, chapter. Lord, you, judgment and justice are the habitation of thy throne. Help us to have wisdom. Help us to have true love as we love the good and hate the evil. And help us to pray for those who are wayward sons of God and daughters of God that they may be restored. Lord, give us the right upward look and the right inward look, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.